It is 1929 and the Great Depression has caused mass unemployment across the world. In Australia, it seems everyone is looking for work. The few jobs available are given to whites over blacks. Doug Nichols, a young black man, turns to the thing he does best to survive. He tries out for the Carlton Football Club, but the players are reluctant to have him on their team and the trainers won't rub him down because he has black skin. He doesn't let it get to him. He intends to play football to show he is the equal of any man. This is a story about Doug Nichols and a courageous group of people who refused to accept the place society had made for them. Doug was the first-born child at Kumaragunja Aboriginal Reserve in 1906. Although his family is dirt poor, his childhood seems idyllic, spent playing with his cousins, camping, fishing, and watching the steamers floating along the Murray River, which flows through his people's land, the Yorta Yorta. Across the nation, thousands of Aboriginal people are interned in small parcels of land called reserves. Operated by the government and overseen by white managers, the reserves are designed to protect, but instead constrain the first Australians. Doug Nichols, like all other Aboriginal children, is a ward of the state and the government only provides these children with education up to grade three. But at Kumragunja, the children receive an education outside of what the government provides. Thomas Shadrach James is an Oxford-educated Sri Lankan. He teaches the children after school by candlelight at what he calls the Scholar's Hut. He gives Doug and his cousins the education that they would otherwise not have access to. By his example, he instills in them a conviction that a black person can be as good as any white. After leaving the reserve, Doug Nichols moves to Melbourne, determined to be a star footballer. And it is not long until his prowess on the football field secures him a place on the Victorian state side. Each time Dad would go to Fitzroy or we would be with him, people just would come up to him and they just admired him so much because he was such a dignified person and he had such a lovely way with everyone, black and white people. I remember, you know, children coming up and holding his hand and it, it was just so unbelievable to see this how Dad had this, you know, affection towards people and how people drew towards him. One of Doug's biggest fans is his uncle, William Cooper. A retired shearer also from Kamragunja, he visits the Oval every Saturday to watch Doug train. William Cooper is collecting signatures for a petition to be sent to the King. It is the duty of every man and woman of Aboriginal blood in them over the age of 20 to sign the petition. And I hope my people will not fail to sign and help all they can that we might get improvement. William Cooper. He writes to the Aboriginal protection boards in each state, seeking permission for the Aboriginal people to sign. Queensland and Western Australia both say no. They're calling for better education for Aboriginal people. They're calling for some control over their land. So a lot of the program is this emphasis on citizenship rights, on equal rights. Despite the obstacles, he collects 2,000 signatures. It was a very long, hard campaign. And the 2,000 
Aboriginal people who signed that petition were the people who were not afraid of the consequences. So there were many, many more people who might have thought about signing that petition but couldn't be persuaded because they were in fear of what would happen to them. Cooper tries to enlist Doug to join his fledgling organisation. He hopes his football fame will publicise their activities, but Doug resists getting involved. His heart is in the game. I used to wish I could dodge Uncle William, but he stuck at me. It was William sticking at me and these stories that fired me. Doug Nichols. Doug has seen with his own eyes the conditions that Cooper campaigns against. He was eight years old when he saw his sister forcibly taken by police on behalf of the Aboriginal Protection Board. His mother throws herself into the car in protest, refusing to get out. The police dump her on the roadway, 20 kilometres from the reserve. She returns on foot and heartbroken. We lived in fear. And I seen it when I was a schoolboy, how they used to hide under that schoolhouse, waiting to see who was coming in fear that we might be taken next. Doug Nichols. Doug's sister is taken with other girls to Kudamundra and the boys are sent to Kinchula Boys' Home, some never to be seen again. They are trained as domestic servants to be sent to labour for white families. If they could walk, talk and work, they were sent into domestic service or taken to farms as labourers. Family after family lost their children in this way. Protection laws prevented them from moving away from supervised camps and supervised societies. So that meant living on a reserve or living under contract on a boss's land. William Cooper sends his petition in good faith to the government, but they shelve it and it is never sent to the king. I think there was almost no awareness at all of what was happening to these small Aboriginal populations incarcerated on Aboriginal reserves under the various protection boards or departments of Native Affairs. There was simply no understanding. The view out in um, the white population was that the Aborigines were being looked after. In 1935, Doug Nichols travels by train to play football in Perth. At the railway sidings, he is deeply shocked by the sight of desert people, waiting in rags, begging for food. He gives them everything, and it awakens his compassion. Crossing the Nullarbor Plains, I saw some of my people that I can only say that their lot is tragic. When I return to Melbourne, I intend to bring their condition to the notice of the proper authorities. Doug Nichols. On his return, he finally agrees to join William Cooper's Advancement League. In 1938, they stage a public political stunt. It is a demonstration called the Day of Mourning to coincide with white Australian celebration of 150 years of European occupation. In a silent vigil, William Cooper leads a small procession who walk quietly along the city streets until they reach Australian Hall. 
he's very deliberately calling on government and reminding government that when they are celebrating 150 years of white settlement, that Aboriginal people have no reason to celebrate this. That the coming of whites, he says, for us, is like a moment of death. Now is our chance to have things altered. We must fight our very hardest in this cause. I know that we could proudly hold our own with others if given the chance. We should all work in cooperation for the progress of Aborigines throughout the Commonwealth. Doug Nichols. Nichols is now right beside his uncle, William Cooper. After struggling for so many years, we are going to continue struggling. Protect should mean protect from injury, but the Aboriginal Protection Board do not live up to this ideal. We must continue our struggle until we win our objectives. William Cooper. At the end of the day of protest, a fellow Cumragunja man, Jack Patton, reads out a resolution which is unanimously supported. We, representing the Aborigines of Australia, hereby make protest against the callous treatment of our people by the white man in the past 150 years. And we appeal to the Australian nation to make new laws for the education and care of Aborigines and for a new policy which will raise our people to full citizenship status and equality within the community. Inspired by the event, Jack Patton goes further. He starts a newspaper designed to motivate his people and spread the word that change is needed. He distributes it through the reserves and the people write in expressing their frustration with the Protection Board and their position as second-class citizens. My child took sick on Monday morning, so I rushed him to hospital. Every other house is overcrowded, worse than a city slum. I waited on the veranda to ask for permission to sit beside my sick child. The matron refused permission that night. White people don't give us a decent chance. They always keep us down. How can the government describe such conditions as these as protection of Aborigines? Sherberg is like a jail. We appeal to the white community to protect us against the Aboriginal Protection Board. No one was at my child's bedside when he died. While Cooper, Nichols and Patton are campaigning, back at Kumragunja in 1939, discontent is building under the regime of the white manager, A.J. McGuigan. Formerly, he had been the manager of the Conchilla Boys' Home. And while he was there, he had been the subject of numerous complaints. He had a tendency to beat the Aboriginal boys. Now, rather than this man being investigated by the board and being dismissed, he was moved, along with his wife, to become the managers of Kamaragunja. Now, this is a couple who are deeply authoritarian and rather dismissive of Aboriginal people in the way they behave towards them. The water is contaminated, the rations are inedible, and disease is rampant. McWigan banishes anyone who defies him. The residents write a letter of complaint to the Protection Board, but it is sent back to McWigan, who nails it to the community hall door and invites those who signed to take their names off. It was the most extraordinary example of, of, of intimidation and contempt for this amazing community, this ex extraordinary community of, of thoughtful and assertive and constructive people. McQuiggan treated them with complete contempt and with, with a brutal humiliation. 
William Cooper writes a letter of complaint to the Prime Minister. The people are frightened of McGuigan at any time, but the fact that he carries a rifle about with him makes matters worse. We are not an enemy people, and we are not in Nazi concentration camps, so why should we be treated as such? William Cooper. If um, you misbehaved, according to the superintendent or protector of any of these reserves, you were very promptly packed, separated from your family and packed off to some other part of the country under police escort. That was the immediate consequence. All your rations were cut. All the rations for your entire family were cut. If you wanted to hurt somebody and make them really suffer for being an upstart nigger, you took their children away from them. Or you prevented them from having medical treatment for their children so that their children would die in front of them. That's what they did. Jack Patton returns home to Kamragunja to discuss their plight. While speaking to a public meeting of residents about conditions, Patton is arrested by police and hauled off stage. Within hours of Patton's arrest on the 3rd of February, the decision is taken by 200 of the 300 residents to pack up their lives and leave the reserve in protest. They cross the river to Victoria. The event becomes known as the Kamragunja Walk-Off. remember seeing all the people walking across the paddock with bikes and wheelbarrows and, and swags and prams. There was a couple of horses and drays. Different people would be walking just carrying their swags, men, women and little kids. And when you look back, you can see them all across the, this paddock and they just made it to the other side and that all these people camped along the river on the opposite side to Kamraganja on the Victorian side. People had been allocated a position in society and that was to be a second rate Australian. You're on the bottom rung of society and you deliberately step off it to go back to, the, you know, ground zero again, as a matter of principle. People knew they were gonna suffer, and uh, giving up the only scrap of land that they had for something even more uncertain, that's defiance, isn't it? They use this, the symbolism of a walkout and a strike. Now that's something that's recognisable to uh, many members of the white working class and the political movement as a, a political and industrial action. It's very hard for the Aboriginal people to sustain this protest. But what happens is that the labour movement in Melbourne very much get behind the walk-off. And Nichols and others in Melbourne are speaking on the Yarra Bank trying to raise money, uh, walking the streets of Melbourne, really, in, or, in order to, to beg support for money, for clothes, for food. Doug Nichols was a bridge across society. I saw it personally, how he could talk to white people when most Aboriginal people wouldn't even get past first base because of his football prowess and his Christianity 
he was able to approach white politicians. With the death of his mother, Doug has found solace and strength in his faith. He redirects his football career and channels his energy into a church that he establishes in Fitzroy, in the centre of the black community in Melbourne. As a preacher, Doug uses the pulpit to draw attention to the plight of his people, who have walked off Kamragunja and now live in shanty towns and off the rubbish tip across the river. Many of the people who've walked off never return to Kamaraganja. They continue to live in the Barma Forest. They move into some of the small towns in that area. And it's, I think it's a very important moment for some of those people where they say, enough is enough. We're not going to live under white control. We are going to go it alone. McGuigan is sacked in February of 1940, not because of his treatment of the residents, but because he failed to quash the walk-off, which embarrassed the Protection Board and the New South Wales and Victorian governments. What happened then was that the Second World War intervened and everybody, you know, went off to fight. And so all of their dreams were put on hold until well after the Second World War. Jack Patton, is one of the many men who signs up. To my best pal, with best wishes from myself and Selina, on the eve of my departure from the shores of our ancestors, wish me Godspeed and a safe return. Jack Patton. William Cooper, who has lost his son in the previous war, questions the morality of Aboriginal involvement. The Aboriginal now has no status, no rights, no land. He has no country and nothing to fight for but the privilege of defending the land which is taken from him by the white race without compensation or even kindness. William Cooper. Cooper was really angry about the suggestion that Aboriginal men would fight for their country, a country which de denies them citizenship rights. And he says, if you're honestly going to fight Hitler, you have to do better you have to grant Aboriginal people citizenship rights. And it's clear that, that Cooper, in 1938 and 1939, continues to identify the cause of Aboriginal people with the cause of Jewish people and other racial minorities that Hitler is persecuting. In the 1930s, the Australian Defence Forces only welcomed those of predominantly European descent to enlist. As the war machine increasingly demands manpower, some manage to slip through. At the time, the Australian military wouldn't uh, let Aboriginal people enlist easily. And a lot of people um, would have conned their way in by saying that they were other, uh, another race. For Indigenous Australians, I guess, I believe that it would have been a, a really hard decision do I stay here and get treated like scum, or do I go over there and get shot at? Uh, I mean, the thing about combat situations is a, a bullet doesn't know what colour you are. And if you're wearing a uniform, the enemy just wants to kill you. And if someone's going to save your life, you're not going to give a shit whether they're black, white or brindle. You know, you're going to be grateful. And the reality is that I think that wars can sometimes eradicate colour can eradicate heritage and you can just become a man. There were three means by which members of the inferior races were sometimes permitted to be treated in relatively civil ways in Australian society. If they excelled at sport, you have Harold Blair singing opera. In other words, if they could, were entertaining. They were sometimes treated civilly. 
And then the third way, of course, was by military effort. They were given some accommodation because they appeared to white people to be different from the Aboriginal people of their stereotyped imagination. In 1945, Australia celebrates the end of the Second World War. The idea that Aborigines were the enemy within seemed ridiculous after the Second World War because the horror of Nazism and the horror of war rather put things into perspective. The brave new world that people were feeling from the post-war had the capacity to give us a hope that some, someday we might become citizens, that someday we would, we would be equal. But it's a bit of a, a false dawn, because by 1945, women and men are returning, and Aboriginal people who've been carrying out useful war work are being shoved off again. That's the message for Aboriginal people. Well, thanks very much for your war work. Now, get, get out of here and start absorbing yourselves back into the community like what we were trying to do with you in the 1920s. So get on with it. Disappear. In the mid-1940s, the government introduced a pass system called exemption certificates. These exemption certificates allow Aboriginal people to move freely. Without them, their movements are severely restricted by law. They had to carry a piece of paper to show that they were servants or slaves. And so the idea of the exemption was to allow some Aboriginal people to move, not freely, but you know, more freely than their brothers and sisters incarcerated on the reserves because they were a special category of labourer. It meant being able to go off the reserve, being able to get a job, being able to move around without being molested by the police or the or white society. At precisely the same time in South Africa, every black adult is required to carry a pass at all times to limit their movements. Both in South Africa and Australia, the passes are deeply resented. All Aborigines and part Aborigines are expected to eventually attain the same manner of living as other Australians. Enjoying the same responsibility, deserving the same customs, and influenced by the same beliefs, hopes and loyalties as other Australians. Policy of Assimilation 1951. Liberal Party reintroduced the assimilation policy, I think for the very important view that Aboriginal people had to become citizens, they should have equal rights, uh, that this was important for Australia's reputation in the world, but uh, along with it was this view that they were to become like everyone else. So here they were being offered what they'd been fighting for, but the cost was high. You had to forget your Aboriginality and just become Australian. We accepted the fact that we were Aboriginal people and we didn't want to become exempt for fear that we were going to be made to be white people.
if you lived on a reserve, basically you starved in most circumstances. If you wanted your family not to starve, you tried to get work. In order to get work, you had to go off the reserve, you had to apply for an exemption certificate. Well, did that mean people wanted to assimilate? No, I think it meant that people wanted to eat. It was a complex situation and I'm sure people avoided um, identifying with their race to a certain extent. Uh, simply because it was inconvenient and uh, uncomfortable to identify as Aboriginal in that era. And assimilation was the euphemism for breeding Aborigines out of existence. Aborigines had to either become like white people or stay out there as savages. But don't come into white society if you're a savage. But if you want to behave and look like us, then you can stay amongst us so long as you keep your place. They were contemptuous of Aboriginal culture. They weren't trying to assimilate this culture into the wider culture to benefit both. They were trying to eradicate one culture. You know, this is what it was all about, was uh, denying being yourself. All we want is to be able to think and do the same things as white people, while still retaining our identity as a people. Doug Nichols. Sir Douglas Nichols and Others like him had a, you know, a pretty sophisticated view of the world. They loved being Aboriginal. They loved their traditions and they knew a great deal about them. He didn't believe that he was a savage. He didn't believe that his parents or his grandparents were savages. He actually, you know, enjoyed his traditions very much and was very proud of his traditions. Assimilation was attractive pe to people who were trying to survive because they could see that one of the tools was respectability. And if you could set a nice table and uh, dust a nice floor, put nice flowers in the vase and not have a barbecue in the backyard, you were suddenly acceptable in the neighbourhood. But other people refuse the easy option. And they're the champions. They're the people who never bend the knee. And we've always had those people, and they have saved us. In 1957, Doug begins a journey to the centre of Australia to investigate what has become of people who have been moved off their land to allow for the testing of nuclear weapons. Seven in the morning, we feel the, the ground shook and they heard the bang, black smoke come over from the south to our camp. Some old fellows got the Woomera, the spear throw, and trying to make that black smoke go other way, going like that and saying, Mamu, 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 which mean evil spirit. And we, everybody got sick in the camp. It was the sickness, uh, sore eyes, skin rash, diarrhea and vomiting. And our uh, old people, everybody got it. And um, I had a problem with my right eye and uh, didn't take long. I just went blind, that one.
when Dad came back, he was really depressed about what he saw. And then he spoke to other people and, you know, there was a whole lot of people that he got support from. Doug screens the footage he brings back on television in Melbourne to promote awareness of their plight and to seek funds to support the rebirth of the organisation William Cooper began 20 years earlier. The funds pour in and the Advancement League begins organising. And I want to suggest three things why you should bother about the Aborigines. Firstly, we belong to a great family of God and he had made out of one blood all nations of men. Secondly, why you should bother about the Aborigines, we're a part of a great British Commonwealth of Nations. And thirdly, we want to walk with you, we don't wish to walk alone. At the same time, plans are afoot to establish a national black organisation. Doug Nichols writes to his colleagues in other states and in 1958, what will become known as the Federal Council for the Advancement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, FACATSI, is formed. It is the beginning of a national black consciousness. Not only for white people, but for many Aboriginal people who were too afraid to object to their circumstances, were so terrified of these extraordinary people who simply told the truth, who simply made out a rational argument for why people of a different colour should not be treated appallingly. You know, they were relentless campaigners. They never stopped campaigning. They worked so hard We wanted Aboriginal representation. We wanted our own people in positions of power. The people who came to the Fakatsi conferences were brilliant orators. And um, people always began meetings with prayers and singing and people were always well dressed. And they were extraordinary in their outlook. They were the most interesting people I've ever met. The formation of Fakatsi coincides with a worldwide movement to assert the rights of black people living in Europe, Africa and the US. In Australia, students from Sydney University burn the American flag in protest at segregation in the US. They are criticised in the press for ignoring similar conditions in Australia. They decide to take direct action by taking a bus ride through New South Wales to see for themselves how segregated their own country is. One Aboriginal man travels with them. He is their fellow student, Charlie Perkins. A lot of Australians talk about, oh yes, we, we want to give the Aboriginal a fair go, then it's full stop and it's usually forgotten. They never go on to say, look, we propose that we give such and such a scholarship to a number of Aborigines. Let us support Aboriginal organisation. Let us vote in favour of any legislation which allows for the elevation of the Aboriginal people. They don't do these things. They talk about it, but they never do it. What begins as a research trip soon turns into a protest at what they discover. The students protest outside swimming pools that refuse entry to Aboriginal children. We don't want to hand it over to the black fellows. And as far as I'm concerned, run the lot of them clean out of the swimming pools. What, all the Aborigines? Every one of them. And the university and the churches, churches as well. As well. As well. Yeah. Away and my they protest at the RSL clubs, which ban Aboriginal ex-servicemen from becoming members.
segregation in country towns was very much a, uh, a problem. And the, 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 that white society could stop Aboriginal people from using public facilities on, on a vigilante scale was abhorrent to Charlie. And so this is one of the things that he attacked when he, when he took the bus of students out west. At that time, to have Aboriginal people and white people swimming together in a swimming pool was the, you know, the most shocking case of breaching the rules of racial hygiene imaginable to white people. White people uh, cringed when they thought they were bathing in the same water as Aborigines. I remember when I went to high school, some of us took swimming because we were pretty good swimmers. All the white kids could automatically walk into the baths. There was no problems, but of course all black kids had to line up in a group and uh, be escorted in, have our money paid for us, uh, taken to the showers and made to scrub ourselves with soap and wash our hair, then have a, a lice check, and uh, we were then allow allowed into the, the baths, in a particular section, the corner section of the baths. And we were allowed to swim around in that corner until 3 o'clock, and when the, the official school time ended, a bell rang at the bars, and that meant that all, uh, all Murrays had to vacate the bars, and that was at three o'clock every Wednesday afternoon. The Freedom Ride brought into people's lounge rooms the plight of Aborigines that they'd been uh, uh, burying their heads in the sand about for at least since the war. The students are led away from the pool by police. Their protest receives mass media attention and eventually the ban is lifted. The Aboriginal kids are led into the pool. You read the newspapers after the Freedom Ride, see those photos, the kids, the black kids in the swing pool is one that I'll never forget. Um, and I think it was a seismic change in Australia. I think there are footsteps. The Freedom Rides took place just as the campaign for a change to the Constitution was being mounted by people all over the country. Doug and the other members of Fikatsi have undertaken a 10-year campaign to push for a referendum to change the constitution. They ask Australians to vote yes to allow Aboriginal people to be counted in the census and for the Commonwealth Government to be able to make laws on their behalf. It's important that we should have the maximum vote because the eyes of the world are on Australia. Australian natives are not a primitive people, but a people living in primitive conditions. They are entitled to a better deal than they are receiving from the white man. If given the opportunity, they could fly high, but they have been denied their rights by being kept a race apart. Doug Nichols. The 1967 referendum just promised to count Aboriginal people and allow the Commonwealth to make legislation on their behalf. But that's not much, is it, really, to be counted uh, when it's so obvious that you're there and have always been there. I didn't see it as much of a promise, but I knew what it had cost uh, those people who fought for it and maybe I didn't show enough respect in those days to that fight and the position from which they'd come because I was already, you know, I was at university and I was a, a champion smart ass and um, I, didn't, I didn't see it for what it was, for the seismic shift that it actually created in Australian thought.
It is a landslide victory. More than 90% see the justice of the question and they vote yes. When uh, the referendum uh, was held and won, we were overjoyed. We were having parties across uh, Sydney and we, we thought that the world had changed and um, that things like citizenship uh, were, were part and parcel of that. We were wrong. I don't think most people saw it, the consequences of constitutional change as being anything other than giving the ABO a fair go. Even though um, some things had changed, there were many things that remained the same. Individuals who joined together under the banner of Fikatsi managed to change the course of their country. I don't think that they were the kind of people who could ever be boxed into some pathetic idea of what their place might be. They were extraordinary human beings. If some white person came along to them and said, you should know your place, this was said to me, of course, you should know your place. You'd actually have to, oh, I did, I, I would stop and think, what are they talking about? You know, I didn't know what they were talking about. You know, well, what, what, do I suddenly stop being a human being because some white person that I've never met thinks that my behaviour's out of order? 40 years after William Cooper wrote his petition that was never given to the King, his nephew Doug Nichols is appointed as the Queen's representative, the governor in the state of South Australia. Dad rang me up in the middle of the night, said he's, he's the governor, he's the governor, you know, like for my father who was like a childhood friend. Um, but my father was slightly in awe of him as well because of it. You know, my father spoke about it in terms of goodness, not in terms of black or white, but goodness. And, you know, he loved him. I, Sir Douglas Ralph Nichols, officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire, do swear that I... I can see it now. Well William was the contact that brought me back to our people. Everything comes back to William Cooper. He fired me to follow through. We must continue our struggle until we win our objectives. Tax should mean protect from injury, but the Aboriginal Protection White Board men pretend that the Australian Aborigine is a low type who cannot be bettered. Our reply is, give us a chance. What was really happening in this country, not what people thought was happening, but what was really happening, and what was really important happening. important that we should have the maximum vote because the eyes of the world are on Australia. And thirdly, we want to walk with you we don't wish to walk alone. Tell your story at First Australians Online. You can upload a video, audio, image or text and include your story in this online history of Australia. Go to sbs.com.au slash first Australians for the untold story of Australia.